Has life gotten a little too busy? Learn to be a man of God at any pace. Join Influencers West each week with speaker and teacher Pete McKinley. Influencers is a men's ministry designed to help men become men of God no matter where they're called to worship. You may find us at InfluencersWest.org. Welcome to Influencers West. do without Sam in, uh, in this in, 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 in little Sam thanks for being here Travis we had a great great powerful prayer time this morning and um you know, as I was listening to men pray and listening to uh, Joseph to share some wisdom from his heart, what's going on in our world today? And guys, we want to be relevant to what's going on in the world. We don't want to be um, wringing our hands. We don't want to be saying the sky is falling because it's not. Because God is sitting on his throne and he's still in control and he knows exactly what's going on. And he's still in control of what's going on. So don't ever wonder or be confused about that. But it struck me as we were praying, and Joseph was talking about what ISIS is doing over there and all the beheadings that they're doing and, and the evil that's going on. And he made some really poignant points, I thought. One of them was that the devil can never be loyal to himself. Do you ever watch these World War II movies and the Nazis and... If one of their guys got out of line, if, if, uh, if a general lost a campaign or a battle, they killed him. They can't be loyal. The devil cannot be loyal to his own people or to himself. And ISIS and all these guys that, are, that we're looking at that are so evil and that are doing such hideous, evil things are not the enemy. But they are captives of the enemy. Just like you and I have been captives to the enemy. And I'm not equating us to ISIS right now. And we could say, well, we're not going to be going cutting people's heads off. But the spirit of ISIS is that spirit of killing, of shutting up. That's what the crucifixion was all about. Shut him up. Kill him. Get rid of him. And there are times you and I have the same spirit in our heart that we feel like that we want to get rid of something. We want them to shut up. And it could be a person. It could be a spouse, a, a child, a dog. Our neighbor's dog. <laughs> My dog doesn't bother me like the neighbor's dog bothers me. <laughs> I don't know what it is with that. I guess that's why I'm teaching this message this morning. <laughs> I need to hear it. But as I was watching these men pray, I had the thought that, you know, the only thing that can stop the spirit of ISIS, the spirit of Nazism, the spirit of dictatorship and tyrants, the only thing that can stop abortion and immorality is we see it just becoming the norm. Perversity becoming the norm. The only thing that can stop it is prayer. The only thing that can stop it is the name of Jesus and the Spirit of God. Is we come before Him and we do battle. We stand in between the destruction of the world and the devil and the salvation of the world. We have a God in heaven who's willing to help. We have people down here who desperately need help, and we're the ones who get to pray and live and strive and fight that battle. We're the ones that have been given the Holy Spirit. We're the ones that have been given power in prayer through the Holy Spirit. We're the ones that have been given the name of Jesus. We're the ones who have been forgiven and stand righteous before God in His eyes. That's us. We have a loving Father. We don't have a tyrant for a father. We don't have a dictator. We have a humble God who came and found himself as a man and humbled himself. 
and took the form of a bond slave. And he humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. That's our God. That's what he was willing to do. And that's his definition of what love is. He's a loving father. He is loyal to his men. He never leaves or forsakes us. Ian Bounds wrote another devotional that I feel like I need to share with you about this humility and connecting it with prayer. Humility is the very life of prayer. Neither pride nor vanity can pray. Now, if, assuming these are true, and I believe with all my heart they are. Let me read it again. Humility is the very life of prayer. Neither pride nor vanity can pray. Now, what we've observed and noticed, at least in my observation and, and opinion, is we're not a praying church today. We're, men today are not prayer warriors. Men today, as a matter of fact, have an adversity to prayer. And, and I've been seeing this for years, in all the years of my ministry, and I had an adversity to prayer. And I couldn't figure out what my problem was. I realized that my problem was that, and let's go over it again. My problem was I thought God was disappointed in me. I thought I wasn't measuring up. I wasn't keeping all the rules. I wasn't living good enough. And see, my view of God depended on how I was performing. And if I was performing good and I'd done some good things and, you know, kind of felt like God had used me or something, then I thought maybe God loves me. But all I'd have to do is do the secret sin, say the the wrong words, have that sinful feeling in my heart, whatever it was, an emotion, And then I thought, well, God's disappointed in me. See, we get jerked around with that. And we don't think he's a loving father. He's a hard taskmaster. If that's the God we have, he's a hard taskmaster. But he said of himself, and the only self-description is, you probably remember of himself, he says, come to me if you're weary, beaten down with all this sin and all this guilt, all this inability to control your own life, your own voice, your own speech, your own habits, your own thoughts. How's that working out for you, by the way? How are you doing it controlling all this sin in your life? How are you doing it controlling your pride, your anger, your lust? All those thoughts that you have that you don't want flashed on the screen up here. See, we're battling. We're battling our own flesh and selfish pride. We're battling the devil who does not wish us well. We're battling a world system that's going to hell in a handbasket, if you will. But we're men of God. And we need to remember who we are. I was talking to a guy on the phone this week and he was struggling with a certain issue and he was out of control. He was emotional, he was angry. It's something that had happened to a member of his family and he needed to settle down. He needed to calm down. He needed to get hold of himself. Are you able to do that? See, that's what a man of God has to learn to do. He has to learn to control himself. He's in a battle and in that battle, he's going to win some, he's going to lose some. His family is going to be attacked. His money is going to be attacked. His job is going to be attacked. His self-image is going to be attacked. So we're under attack. Incoming, we say. As soon as that person walks in. And we have to be able to handle that. See, your job and mine is we have to be able to handle that person, that circumstance. We have to be able to take a punch. Without punching back. See, it's not just taking the punch, it's not punching back. As a matter of fact, I heard uh, on Sports Center they were talking about a, one of the NBA games and teams. Um, don't even remember which one, but I do remember the sportscaster. And the sportscaster was saying, you know, he got elbowed in the face and was wise enough not to punch back. 
And it struck me as I've observed the world. The world loves to see a humble person. They had a GM of one of the major league baseball teams, and they were interviewing him at spring training. And he had made some, he was a brand, I think it's his first year as a GM, and he had made some amazing trades. I think he was uh, GM of the Padres. He had made some amazing deals and, and gotten some real superstar athletes. They've been one of the worst offensive teams in the league for all, as long as anybody can remember, and now they got some real studs. And so the pressure's on for those studs to do well. And I think they will. But they were praising him. And, and she said, it's been said, that this little interviewer, it's been said that, that you're uh, strong and you're a leader. And, you're, and she gave a bunch of accolades. She says, are you? He says, no, I'm not. He says, you know, we just happen to see some things fall into place. And now our job is to create the best environment for a bunch of athletes to give them the ability to win and bring a championship home. Well, anyway, the guys in the, in the, in back at ESPN headquarters, after watching the interview, were talking, and the one guy says, you know what I like about him? It's not that he's made a lot of good trades. It's not that he's, you know, the best GM in the world. He may or may not be. I like his humility. I like how humble he was about what he's been able to accomplish. And it struck me that the world loves humility. I mean, we don't, we we have a hard time in the secular world, the Christian world, everybody loves humility. They love to see a humble athlete. But what do we see mostly? The world also loves to strut itself, to promote itself. And you look out and you think, thinking themselves wise, they became fools. It's not, it's not a real stretch to connect pride and self-confidence with what Proverbs calls a fool. Matter of fact, I think you could interchange those two pretty easily. What does it say about me if vanity cannot pray? So if we got a bunch of men that can't pray, what are we really dealing with here? We're dealing with our own pride, our own vanity... Because, see, when you walk into the presence of Almighty God, there's only one attitude to have. Micah 6, 8. He has told you, old man, what is good and what you ought to do. Love justice, do mercy, or do justice and love mercy, and walk proudly with God, telling him how lucky he is to have you on his team. I don't think that really flies with him. Walk humbly with your God. However, how else can you walk with God other than humbly? It's a positive quality, a substantial force that energizes prayer. There is no power in prayer to ascend without it. Humility springs from a lowly estimate of ourselves and of our being deserving. To be clothed. Clothed with humility is to be clothed with a praying garment. Humility is realizing our unworthiness, the feeling and declaring of ourselves as sinners because we are sinners. You know, kneeling suits us very well as the physical posture of prayer because it speaks of humility. Guys, I said last week, if we don't get a handle on this, we had not missed anything but the boat. Humility is the essence of the character of the Holy Spirit when he comes into a man's life. Humility never seeks a limelight, but he's willing to be there. But he doesn't seek it. He has no ambition for that. He doesn't promote himself. As a matter of fact, he takes delight in promoting others and making them successful. Humility is a hard thing to get a hold of, though. It's hard to attain. And once you know you've got it, you just lost it. It's slippery. Remember I told you last week about the the guy voted the most humble pastor in America? Well, it's that one. Unfortunately, he wore the medal that 
Said it. I, f I ran across a Psalm 131, and while I'm pulling that up, remember, um, my, my most humiliating moment on a baseball field? Pinch runner. I was sent in one time, we had 17,000 people in the stands, we were used to playing in front of 17 people. Back in Alabama, we were in a Lynchburg, Virginia, in a big tournament. I was 15 years old. I was, they just let me dress out. I'd been a bad boy. They let me dress out for the tournament because it was my brother's age, which was about two or three years older than me, 19-year-old tournament or something. And um, we got in, into late innings in a tight ball game, and our catcher was on. Our catcher was not a real fast afoot. So the manager, our coach, put me in to pinch run for him. And the guy tried to pick me off. And it could have gone either way. I mean, it was so close. He could have called me out. Nobody would argue. He'd call me safe, which he did, thank the Lord. <laughs> and I was sitting over there thanking the Lord. And as I looked up, a guy was trotting at me from the dugout. They were sending a pinch runner in for the pinch runner. <laughs> Seventeen thousand people in the stands. <laughs> you know, you can either humble yourself or God will humble you. Amen. One or the other. Psalm one thirty one. It's only three verses. O oh Lord, my heart is proud. Not proud. Oh Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I don't concern or involve myself with great matters or things too difficult, too awesome, or too wonderful for me to grasp. Instead, I have calmed and quieted myself. Like a weaned child who no longer cries for its mother's milk. Yes, like a weaned child is my soul within me. You know, this is a conversation, it's like you would be journaling, and it's a conversation between David and God. It wasn't for other men's ears. It's something he was talking to God about, and he talked to God because God alone knew his heart. Now, there's this thing where Paul would say, you guys are judging me for, for this, but I don't even judge myself. I don't even know my own heart. God knows my heart. So there's a part of this where I think I'm doing well, but I may not be. And so knowing your own heart and coming before God, wouldn't it be great if we could just stand before God and say, God, my heart is not proud. I have nothing in me, nothing in me that wants to promote myself. My heart, my heart is not haughty, neither proud in my opinion of myself or contemptuous to others, nor self-righteous before the Lord. Neither boastful of the past, proud of the present, or ambitious for the future. You know, we live in a world system that tells you that all those, those things are virtues. Ambition is a virtue. Promoting yourself is a virtue. Putting yourself first is a look out for yourself. You're number one. And meanwhile, we got the God is dead that started in the 60s, and now those same people are in office now running our country, and God is still, their God is still dead. And they want our God to be dead. But I got news for them. They tried that before. They tried killing him and shutting him up, but somehow it just didn't work. We're going to celebrate that here in a month or so. That we have a risen Savior who death could not hold. Amen? Amen. 
My eyes are not lofty. See what the, he's connecting his heart and his eyes. What the heart desires, the eyes look for. Guard your heart with all diligence. And guarding your heart is the, the mind and the heart and the eyes. They're all connected. What do you think happens when you look at pornography? Where's the heart? What are you setting your heart on? And then what are the eyes looking for? Or what if you're a glutton and a bakery is your favorite place on earth? What are your eyes looking for? Donuts. We still got a few back there for you guys that are, I'm talking about. Punch a guy next to you and say, hey, listen up. <laughs> Where the desires run, the glances usually follow. Where the heart is right, the eyes are right. Guard your heart with all diligence. Because when the heart is right, the eyes are right. See, when your heart is right with God and you're practicing a discipline... Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says, you know, I'm not shadow boxing here. I'm not just punching the air. I want to hit something. I want to make something happen. Now, right now, I don't care what your circumstance is. I don't care if you have a job or you don't have a job. If you have a family or you don't have a family. I don't care if you got money or don't have money. If you have a place to sleep tonight or you don't have a place to sleep tonight. If people don't think much of you, and you don't think much of you. The truth of the matter is, you're a man of God. Those circumstances don't define you. They don't limit you. And they don't define who you are. God has already defined who you are. You're his man. You're a royal priesthood. You're a people for his own possession. You belong to him. He's gifted you. He's called you. He's forgiven you. He has a plan for your life. I don't care what your circumstances are. I don't care how bad your past has been. I don't care how many mistakes and stupid moves you've made. Join the Stupid Move Club. That's our next t-shirt. Stupid is as stupid does. Join the, the club of the guys who... Left to our own are just set to self-destruct. But we found the source. We found the power. We found the life. Better said, it found us. He came to get us. So Paul says, you know what, guys? I buffet my body. I discipline my body. I treat it roughly. I bring it under control. Now, I struggle with buffeting my body and bringing it under control. I'm probably the only guy in here who's got that problem. But if it comes to eating right, I struggle. If it comes to exercise, I struggle. Disciplining myself, reining myself in, reining my emotions in, reining my lusts in, reining my hunger in, reining my speech in. But if we get the heart right, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he takes care of all this other stuff. He brings along with him the humility, which is power under control. And he brings along with that. All that I need, he's withheld nothing back. All that I need to be his man right now today, his disciplined man. And as I focus on him and as I spend time in his presence, as I focus on the cross and the power of the cross, the power of forgiveness, as I focus on what he has done for me and as I see him sitting high and lofty on his throne, standing with Isaiah, realizing that I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a bunch of men of unclean lips, cleansing comes. It changes me. I have a loving father. He's not a tyrant. He humbled himself for my sake. And he's calling me to humble myself for his sake. To empty myself out. He's calling me to give up the right 
to myself. Why would he do that? Why does God want me and you to give up our right to ourself? Well, it's because the more I hold on to myself and try to save my life, that's what it is. He says, I'm going to lose it. I don't want you to lose your life. The quickest way for you to lose your life is to try to save it and hold on to it and keep it. It's not about your plan. It's my plan. It's not your will. It's my will. Because my will is in your best interest. I don't care how it feels or what it looks like. And if you're carnal and you're pretty worldly, you hate God's counsel. If you're giving godly counsel to someone, biblical counsel, Jesus counsel to someone, and you can tell it makes them mad. They're not going, oh, wow, man, that's great. They're going, stick that where the sun don't shine. I've had guys literally get mad at me because I was just saying, well, let me just tell you what Jesus said about that. They don't want to hear that. I had guys come to me and say, so-and-so is really struggling. I told him to come see you. But he told me he knows what I'm going to tell him, and he ain't coming. <laughs> so tell him the truth, and you're, you don't have to worry about having to counsel people all the time. Some people know what I'll tell them. They just need to hear it again, so they come. But speak the truth and do it in love. But speak the truth. Speaking the truth and it's not in love, it's not going to work very well. You're not superior. You're together in this struggle. We all struggle like this. There's no sin that's unique. There's no sin that, boy, you're the only guy that's ever thought that or done that or made that stupid move. There's nothing new under the sun when it comes to sin. And with this kind of crowd in a room like this, we got every sin you could ever commit already down, okay? If we started listing all of them, or if God threw them up on the screen, there'd be nothing left out. Nothing we hadn't done or experienced. Nothing hadn't been done to us. Are we done to others? And so God came to clear all that up. Jesus Christ came. See, I know you're going to struggle with that. I know you're going to have tribulation and trials, and you're going to be tested. Your faith will be tested. Your character will be tested. And you're not always going to pass the test. What do you do when you don't? Humility understands that it's not always going to pass the test. As a matter of fact, back to Brother Lawrence, the practice of the presence of God, I'm not surprised when I sin, I'm surprised when I don't. See, that's humility. Humility has a firm grasp on who God is and a firm grasp on who he is. Do you have a firm grasp on who you are? Are you working real hard to be a real good boy? You're one of the most tired guys in here if that's what you're trying to do. Jesus said, in, back to Matthew 11, Come to me if you're weary and heavy laden. I'll give you, I'll give you assignment. I'll give you lecture number three. Now, if you're really beaten down and beat up, if the world has had its way with you, if you can't seem to do anything right for that person or that boss or that wife or those kids... And you're just whipped. And a guy came up to me and said, my son's really whipped. Pray for him. He had someone who paid him who didn't take taxes out. He's three years behind in taxes, and now he doesn't even want to live. He's ticked off at God. He's ticked off at everything. The world has a way of beating us up. But see, the humble man understands God is in control, God is in charge, and there's nothing too big for him to handle. He doesn't have to be discouraged, he doesn't have to be depressed. He's been looking at others and getting distressed and looking at himself and getting depressed. And Jesus is saying, look at me. Look what I've promised you. Look what I've done for you. Look what I can give you and I've already given you. Don't forget who you are. And get eternity in your heart, will you? These circumstances you're going through and the stuff that's attacking you, it's all a test. It's all to develop. It's all to build you. Remember the rock? 
push the rock. It's all about pushing the rock, pushing that thing that's so big, it's such a big problem. And God just says, just push the rock. You'll get stronger. When I get ready, I'll move the rock. Meanwhile, you just push it. You be faithful. Keep a good attitude. Marshal your thoughts and your heart. Because you can have any attitude you want. You got a bad attitude this morning? Why'd you choose that? Because you chose it. Oh, no, it's, you, you don't know what I'm going through. You, I don't care what you're going through. You chose the attitude that you have. A humble man chooses an attitude of submission before God and accepts whatever God puts in or takes out of his life. That's what humility does. Pride says, I deserve better than this. What is God thinking? Pride leads you to, leads you to destruction, suicide, taking your own life, walking away from your marriage, going back to your vomit. That's what a fool does. Just like a dog returns to a f- his vomit, a fool returns to his folly. Over and over again, we see men going back to their alcohol, back to their porn, back to their stuff, their vomit. That's what a fool does. And I see men after men after men not learning from life's tests and circumstances. When God puts us through a test or a trial, he wants us to learn from it. Here's a question. God, what are you thinking? Why are you letting this happen? But here's another question. That was the prideful guy, the self-confident guy, the guy that thinks he deserves better. The humble guy says, God, what are you, part of your character and fruit of your spirit are you trying to build into my life through this circumstance? Question number three. Do you want to spend the rest of your life becoming just like Jesus? If you turn the corner... Of lordship. If you turn the corner of deciding that the whole purpose of my life is to become like Jesus Christ so that I may win people to Jesus Christ. And that's all of grace. It's nothing that I do except put myself in his presence and decide, make the decision that I want to be just like Jesus. Now you're going to have trials and tests and problems and you're going to be attacked by the devil either way. Guys, the devil will come along and say, yeah, you just decide that and I've got a target on you and I'm coming after you. Well, crud, he's coming after you anyway. You're going to listen to his deception and his lies? We say, well, come on, brother. Nothing the Lord can't handle. You just bring it on. I'm just going to become more humble. I'm going to become more godly, more gentle, more kind. I'm going to just get more hope. And when you take that attitude, and every time he comes at you, you go to the Lord, and you learn a character trait and a fruit of the Spirit, the devil is going to say, that ain't working. I may, I may need to call the dogs off. The more I come at him, the more godly he gets. That's a choice. Pride says, I deserve better than this. I've worked hard. I deserve it. Humility says... Better than I deserve. I heard a guy say that years ago. How you doing? Doing better than I deserve. I've said that to people before. and They go, oh no, you deserve. You deserve what you're getting. I said, and I don't want to get, deserve what I'm getting. If I get what, what I deserve, I don't want it. I want to get what I don't deserve. That's heaven and grace and forgiveness. What do you want? What have you decided? Guys, time's running out. Either you, 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 it's running out on a lot of us in here. I'm looking at a lot of gray hair. But you know, some of you guys that's just bald and don't have gray hair. Your time could be running out too. You never know. But time is short either way. We need to redeem the time. Let's humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that we may be on his team. Because he's opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So humble yourself so he doesn't have to humble you. When you humble yourself, all the trials and all the tests and all the crud that comes your way is not a burden. Going back and asking forgiveness is not a burden. Sharing a need and saying, guys, I'm hurting, I'm weak, I don't know, I need help. See, pride says, can't say that. That's the old man code. Pride can never say that. So it isolates you. And what the devil wants to do is take you as a sheep, a dumb sheep, an obtuse sheep, a stupid sheep. And he wants to isolate you over here where you can't say, I have a need. You can't 
say I'm hurting. You can't say I don't know. You can't say I love you. And so he isolates. That's what pride does. Humility says, hey guys, I need your prayer. You have to be a desperate man to do that, but Christianity is a rescue effort for desperate men. And so humility says, you know, I'm hurting. You know, I need help. I can't get out of this by myself. I'm going to need some guys to help me out. If you're talking to prideful guys, they say you shouldn't have gotten yourself in that situation in the first place. No grace. But another humble guy says, that could be me. I want to help my brothers. Jesus came to lift up the the head. A broken reed he will not, a bent reed he will not break. And a dimly burning wick he will not put out. That's what humility is. Humility is looking for a place to serve. Humility is looking for a place to help, to lift up. It's always likes the shadow, doesn't want to be unknown, has no ambition that God hasn't put on his heart. And his only ambition is like Paul, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. That's my ambition. And then you don't have to worry about all that other stuff. You don't have to worry about how people are going to treat you, if you're going to get the job or not, if it's going to work or not, if she's going to say yes or no. You're free. The humble man is a free man. The prideful man will always be in bondage. And so let's get free, guys. The only way to get free is to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in me at the proper time. So I want to encourage you. You serve a God who loves you. He's a loving God. You serve a Savior who's a loving Savior who's demonstrated on the cross his manhood. And his manhood was humility and submission and brokenness and a broken and contrite heart. Psalm 51 says he'll never cast out. You can always come to God with a broken and contrite heart. And if you're not coming to God, it's because there's something in your life you won't humble yourself to. There's some sin in your life that you won't take care of because you'd have to humble yourself to take care of it, to make it right. You'd have to confess it. You'd have to acknowledge it. You'd have to say, yes, it's a sin. God, would you forgive me? The prideful heart can't do that. You pray for a broken heart before God. Pray that God wouldn't have to humble you, but you can humble yourself before Almighty God and become like your Savior who had nowhere to lay his head, who never bragged about himself. He never shouted in the streets. He didn't have a promotion team going out ahead of him. He told people, look, I know I just healed you, and I know that's a big deal, but don't go tell anybody about it. I don't need that kind of press and promotion. Let's ask God for that humble spirit. Let's ask God for that broken spirit spirit that builds strength, that makes a real man. That's where the real strength is. That's what a real man of God is. He doesn't have to defend himself and explain himself. He doesn't have to take up for himself all the time. Vindicate himself all the time. He lets God do all that. And he's free. I love that. I got a chance to be free. I got a chance to be free. I don't have to be burdened down by all this stuff. I got a chance to trust God and that truth sets me free. Can we stack hands on that this morning? Father, that's what we're going to do. We're going to stack hands on being free in Jesus Christ, and that means being humble in your presence. And, Lord, we can come to you in prayer. We don't have to worry that you're disappointed or that you don't like us, so you won't welcome us. We know that you will, for you're a loving Father who welcomes his kids, especially, Lord, when we come into your presence with thanksgiving and humility and brokenness, saying, God, you're God and I'm not. Lord, I just want to be yours, and I want your will, not my will. And I know what's best for me, and that's being right in the middle of your will, no matter where it is or what it's doing. And I choose an attitude of humility today, of brokenness, to making others more important than myself, having the same attitude in me that's also in Christ Jesus. That's all we want. 
because we want to represent you well out there to a world that loves humility, which means that they'll love Jesus when we show them what that, his humility looks like. Help us do it in his name. And all God's men said, Amen. Give them heaven, guys. <laughs>